Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we are fortunate to have two great journalists and experts um, to talk about what is a journalism exit. First, we have Sarah Beth. She is the CEO of the American Journalism Project, which is a new venture philanthropy organization dedicated to local news. Previously, Sarah Beth was the global head of public affairs at Teach for All, a network of social enterprise. And Sarah Beth had also spent seven years in China, um, where she led fundraising and recruitment at Teach for America. And we also have Marcus Broccoli. He's the co-founder of North Base Media, an investment firm specialized in media and technology in investment in global growth markets. He served as an advisor to many media groups and previously was the executive editor of the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. And I'm Paul Chun with the Knight Foundation. I'll be your guest host today. Um, before we jump into the topic, Marcus, you know, you were watching the previous panel with Team Ram where they were talking about advertising. What were some of your reaction to that panel? Um, I thought Tim's observations were extremely astute, uh, particularly the advertising to deliver for its for its clients, and a risk that that failure as the as as the awareness grows that targeted digital advertising, programmatic advertising doesn't actually do all it promises, the risk that advertisers will defect from that, from those, from those platforms, um, and what the what the decline in revenues that result from that may mean for media publishers could be quite significant. Now I actually think what will happen is advertisers, advertisers are always looking to connect with audiences. They want to connect credibly with audiences, they want to reach the right audiences. And if the if the technology solutions, the pure tech solutions don't accomplish that for them, they will find other solutions. And I think we see even in the in companies that we work with, there are a lot of advertisers who they will pay extra to know that they're getting something either of quality or that they're in a brand safe environment or that they're reaching somebody they really want to reach, even if the audience may not be so large, and even if the experience of placing the advertisements might not be as easy as it is on some platform built by Facebook or Google. So jumping right into the uh, thick of things in terms of um, sort of um, business revenue for journalism, um, Sarah Beth and Marcus, as investor, is advertising your only revenue source or is it still the predominant revenue source for the companies that you're investing in? Sarah Beth? I mean, I can just kick off and say decidedly not. In fact, the, the newsrooms that we're investing in, we're very, um, the business model of nonprofit news, we believe that the vast majority of local news is going to be best served through a nonprofit model. And that means that advertising really is a very small portion of their revenue model. In fact, the large majority of their revenue model is focused on building a community of support, investing philanthropists in the mission, getting philanthropists and reader revenue. Yes, using advertising corporate sponsorship, um, as well, but not relying on that specifically. Yeah, just to go back to what, what Tim was saying a minute ago, Tim, Tim made the excellent observation that advertising is not going to be the only revenue source for media. Um, the nonprofit approach for local media that, that Sarah Beth is describing and, and pushing is an extremely, is likely to be an extremely widespread model for a lot of smaller publishers. You know, that you can get community support to justify having community information. And it may not, you know, the advertising model, which was, uh, you know, the traditional model of local newspapers, they, they got a little bit of subscription revenue and they got a lot, lot of advertising revenue. That model is not the only model going forward. I, I used to spend a lot of time going to journalism conferences around the world. And the question people would always ask is, as the digital revolution began to sweep traditional publishers aside, was what's the new model? And the expectation among people in journalism used to always be, there's gotta be another model like our old model. And the old model, which we all know was a pretty fantastic model, was the monopoly model. You know, you, you basically, you own your town or you own your, your market and you sell subscriptions and aggregate a big audience and then you sell advertising against that audience. And if advertisers wanna reach the audience, you know, they have to use your, they have to use your platform. When I, I came to the Washington Post as editor in 2008, and at that time, I made a joke, which was only half joke, that 
you know, the Washington Post strategy was answer the phone because they were a monopoly paper and, you know, advertisers who wanted to reach the audience had to call the Washington Post. And obviously that changed dramatically and the Washington Post has changed dramatically and for the good, but it was, it was the tradition of publishing. Today, I think subscriptions, not subscriptions in the old way, which is where subscriptions were used, you know, to get people anchored into a publication to charge them basically the cost of delivering, throwing the newspaper on the lawn, but subscriptions today to cover the cost of production of the content. And, and there's gonna be e-commerce, you know, there's gonna be events, there's gonna be all kinds of other revenue streams for publishers. And some of their model, a nonprofit model, that Sarah Beth is talking about, but even the nonprofit model, there'll be revenue streams, you know, publishers are gonna look for ways of creating revenue to support their businesses. And Sarah Beth, you know, we talk about the nonprofit model, like what is the nonprofit model and how is that different? Yeah. And, you know, I love to hear from Marcus, it sounds to me like, what is the contrast between nonprofit model and the new for-profit model for digital upstart? Like they sound to me very similar, right? Subscription, subscription, subscriptions. Yeah. Um, well, let me pull back for a second and just set the table. Um, over the past 15 years, we've seen this sharp decline in the newspaper industry, one that we're all very familiar with. We know that you know, 1,800, 1800 communities across our country in 2004 had a newspaper. Now, as of the beginning of two, 2020, they do not have that newspaper. And you know, I think from far away, it can look a lot like an industry disruption that we're all very familiar with, you know, the blockbuster of news. We used to have 9,000 blockbuster stores. We no longer do. That's bad for blockbuster. It has not really mattered for us as consumers because frankly, the technology is much better now. But the decline of newspapers and the reason why Marcus and I are obsessed with this problem is not because of some nostalgia for the paper boy route. This is because we know that the decline of newspapers has meant the decline of original reporting. And that is essential to our democracy. And we have also seen over the last decade and a half, the very clear and very measurable impacts that that has had on, on our society and our political culture. We know that when a newspaper goes away, voter participation drops. We know that civic engagement drops. We know that government, rate, government waste increases. We know that voter patterns become more polarized. The polarization in our, in our country can be partly attributed to the lack of newspapers and original reporting in communities. So then that leads us to say, okay, for a long time, we have relied on a market transaction, the transaction of ad revenue to support what is fundamentally a public good, something that is enshrined in our First Amendment to the Bill of Rights as you know, essential, an essential ingredient to our democracy. That market has failed, and yet we know that this is really essential. So now the question is: okay, how do we finance and sustain an informed electorate? And that brings us to saying, okay, rather than trying to grasp at what we've always relied on, which is a separate market transaction to support local news, right? In the case of the advertising model, we were selling ads against uh, selling ads and then using that to put some of that money into original reporting. Now we're saying, let's create a business model that actually aligns the impact of the organization and the revenue model, which is to say, let's recognize that we need to step up as community members, as philanthropists, and, and support this part of our democracy. And so the nonprofit business model is essentially an alignment of the revenue model and the mission of these organizations. These, we, there are lots of examples of these that are really thriving. I'll point to a few. Um, the Texas Tribune, which uh, which many people in this industry know really well and really, I think, pioneered this model, but we're seeing this expanding across the country. They have a business model that is a philanthropic first business model. 50% of their revenue comes from major gifts and foundations. They've also figured out revenue, earned revenue. So Marcus just ref referenced events. They run an awesome event that raises a lot of money every year. They have 
figured out how to tap into corporate sponsorships. Um, and they are using reader revenue. People are saying, I want this, I'm gonna pay some, some small dollars because they recognize it's important and I appreciate the product. And we're seeing that model um, which the actual ingredients of it look different community by community, but the basic idea, which is that we're going to build institutions that have that civic value to communities, and then we're going to build a revenue stream that is grounded in that. We're going to bring a community of supporters in to support this product that really matters. So that is the, the distinguishing the distinguishing model that we're really, really excited about. We think there's a lot of potential. Marcus, what about you? I mean, you invest in mostly for-profit. How is that different? Well, let me explain. Actually, we're, our media focus is primarily outside of the U.S. Um, we are, we're investors in media in growth markets, places where people have just been getting access to mobile phones and broadband data over the last several years, and where consumption of traditional media wasn't wasn't particularly deep. So as people get access to a phone, they get this device and they're like, what's out there? And we try to work with entrepreneurs to build interesting, useful, high quality information products, it can be news, it can be sports, it can be business information, it can be even some entertainment for, the, for this new generation of people, this large new generation of people who are just coming online and who have no brand loyalties to traditional media. So it's a very different kind of environment that it is in the US because in the US, you know, this is a saturated market and every new media company that comes along has to take eyeballs and mind share away from somebody who's already out there because people's media day is full, whether they're looking on their phone or listening to the radio or watching TV, their day is jam packed. And so newcomers have to take it. Whereas we're in markets where you're building something for an audience that like it's brand new, they're delighted to have access to the content. Um, we're also, as you say, we're in venture capital. So we try to get good financial returns. Most of our investors are actual media companies themselves who are looking for sort of early radar. There's on what's, what trends are emerging in other places. I think there's an awareness that, you know, genius is pretty evenly distributed in the human population. And thanks to digital technologies, good ideas can come from anywhere. And there, and we've seen it, you know, Sarah Beth and I both lived in China. We've seen the dramatic ex explosion in digital media in China, new platforms, new ways of consuming content. You know, the most valuable media news company in the world right now is Toutiao in China, which is a algorithmically driven headline service that's owned by the same people who own TikTok, by the way. And, you know, that, that idea and that way of approaching news, we've taken a similar approach to one of our companies in India. You know, that's a different marketplace than here. In the U.S., we're facing a very different set of challenges. I mean, in the U.S., we're, we're a saturated media market where... Digital media has successfully both taken away audience and profoundly disintermediated advertising, which is the main source of revenue for publishers. So a lot of publishers don't have that, that revenue stream. And as Sarah Beth just said, there's been a lot of failure. I look at, you know, when I look at investing in media, I think you, in, you asked us early when we were preparing for this to think about what the ROI is in, when we invest in media. And as you can tell us in Sarah Beth's taking a nonprofit approach, her ROI is not necessarily that, you know, she's going to make a lot of money by a big house in the Hamptons. Our, our, our ROI, I think, in media investing generally has to be to support quality media, at least one aspect of our success. Because, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but information is the bedrock not only of our democracy, but it's also the bedrock of our global economy. And bad information leads to bad decisions, poor governance, economic failure, misinformation and disinformation are cancers on liberal democracy and free markets. And these are profoundly important issues and getting it right matters. It's not as simple, by the way, as just finding a model that, you know, if we support media and we want to produce media, it will work. We actually have to keep audiences engaged. There are many things that could attract audiences away from journalism and media. So the challenge is not so simple as just like figuring out, can we get revenue in or can we get financial or philanthropic support for a media company? It's how do we get audiences to care about the things they used to care about? Because once they're on their phone, their choice of whether to consume content, consume a story about, you know, a school board decision or, you know, go play Animal Crossing or just get on TikTok and watch videos of people dancing is the, is the choice that we have to help inform and shape. Through our, so, through our quality. 
So as you guys are sort of investor of these companies, you know, again, we talk about the tangible, tangible, um, tangible ROI. How do you translate that mission into very concrete actions or metrics that you could hold these companies by, right? So what is, what is that flywheel you're building so that they could get the momentum they need to succeed? Sarah Beth, perhaps, yeah. Um, so we're very focused on the, the output that these, these organizations are having on their communities. You know, they, I, I mentioned before the, the fact that when a newspaper goes away, we see all these really dire and concrete negative outcomes on our communities. And so we need to start rebuilding that infrastructure to start to reverse the cycle. And frankly, I feel coming out of this election cycle, we've seen so clearly the extraordinarily stark divisions in our country. And we know that having information about what's happening in our communities is one of the things that really could play a role in weaving our communities back together. So as we've been thinking about the return on investment, the return on investment for us is undoubtedly very, very hard to measure. Um, because it is very hard to say what would have, you know, when the fact that we know that government waste increases when local news uh, goes away, we, it is very hard to say, okay, because that reporter was at that city hall meeting, we now know that they are now being more transparent and they are now being more accountable. No one is winning a Pulitzer Prize for showing up at the uh, city hall meeting every day. And yet we know that that has a positive output. So what we've been focusing on our ROI is focusing on really helping these organizations build the revenue structure to fund the fund the, the newsroom. So we're working on an assumption that we know that this is of value to communities. We see examples of that the immediate impact that these organizations can have. I'll give you one example. One of our grantees, Wendy Thomas, um, MLK50 in Memphis, Tennessee, she did extraordinary reporting on the really predatory practices of the hospital systems in Memphis, Tennessee that were collecting debt from poor people. That reporting led to millions of dollars of debt being returned to poor people. Um, and and so we know that the, there is a impact on communities. And so where we are focusing our return on investment is on supporting these organizations to bring in more revenue. So we're specifically focused on investing on the business side of these organizations that allow them to hire development staff, hire marketing staff, and that that in turn allows them to bring in more revenue. So we're specifically holding ourselves accountable for these organizations getting two to three X the return on investment that we make. Um, so that's how we've been thinking about the ROI. I do think there's a lot of really interesting work going on about how to measure the impact of journalism. And I think that journalism needs to get a lot better at telling their story of impact. Journalists are very, very good at telling other people's stories. They are not very good at telling their own stories. Um, of impact, and I think I think there is a lot of work to do to really help communities understand why the loss of journalism in their communities is not just bad for the journalists, but bad for them. Um, so that that's how we have been thinking about the flywheel. The flywheel is ultimately an investment on the strength of our communities. Marcus, what about you? So. As I said, we're venture investors, so we we actually do have to return capital to our investors at some point, and they want to see good returns, and we think we can produce competitive returns by supporting media. And it's not all journalism, just to be clear. Um, and we also invest in technologies that allow companies to engage audiences better, monetize differently, and generally perform better. Um, but I do think that you know the the way we need to judge media and journalism is in in terms of impact. I mean, as a society, I'm not speaking now as an investor. I think journalism does play a vital role. And there's been a lot of technology has been terribly damaging to journalism for a whole lot of reasons, Some, most of which are unplanned and accidental, and but nevertheless real. I mean, in terms of the delegitimization of media, 
which is something that we have to begin to correct. And, and Sarah Beth talked about the narrative that journalists need to tell about themselves. You know, first technology made it seem like really easy. And we we'll began to think, oh, how hard is journalism? I can on Facebook, my friends see it. I'm conducting a kind of journalism. It starts to seem like it's not a complicated thing that journalism does. Second thing it does is it makes it really easy to build content that looks like journalism. So people for the inbox right now, CNN's newsletter, and you sort of say, well, why should I believe this one and not that one? They look the same, they have the same appearance. And then of course, we all know the algorithms at, at the big social media platforms very quickly people into these eddies of self-reinforcing common interests and they, they no longer have access, they no longer see information that differs from what they think. And of course, finally, and, and probably most outrageously, the tech companies, which bear a great responsibility for their actions, but, but as much as possible to avoid it, they monetize you know, people redistributing false information, misinformation, disinformation, and and the undermining of journalism. So we as journalists, I think we have a very large burden on us to establish to people that we actually do create content of value. Now, there's clearly evidence that people think that. You look at the growth in subscription revenue at the New York Times or the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, all the big platforms, you know, people are recognizing they, they do value the quality of information those providers are giving. And I think subscriptions, even the local papers have been growing quite healthily, especially since COVID. People are recognizing that they, they do need the information that these, provide, these companies provide. The question and the challenge for us goes back to what I said before, how do we get them to engage and feel like it's important enough for them to subscribe? And I think local media in the US, and I'm, you know, as I say, we invest primarily outside the US, but There's going to be a lot that's supported by nonprofit, not only through groups like Sarah Betts, but also you know local public radio, which is a huge driver of good journalism in this country. And there's going to be companies that are supported by advertising and subscription. And there's going to be an emergence of all kinds of new ways of generating revenue. And I, I think the local marketplaces, local newspapers, really control their market. They know their audiences. They know the people in those communities. Can they start building out commerce platforms that make sense? So I'm looking. I think there's a lot of experimentation taking place now. And Marcus, you talk, you know, you sort of talk about the 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 bad that the technology sort of had bring, but at the same time, you know, technology had also lowered the cost yeah. of production for a media company because all these media yeah, companies the that, sure. that Sarah Beth that you guys are investing would never be able to establish themselves without the benefit of technology. So do you think like in terms of like the good versus bad, like how much is the good being harnessed, right? Because I think there's this narrative about just all the bad and especially, you know, pointing to the, the big platform player. But, you know, there's also a lot of great things that technology had enabled, um, you know, especially for this group of audience who, who are primarily, you know, um, investors, technology and policymaker sort of like, what would be your message to them? Like, what is their role in making sure, you know, they could, you know, contribute to this journalism flywheel? I mean, we've been thinking a lot about this because at the height of the local news industry, this was a $60 billion industry. And as we look at, look at what we're trying to recreate as we build back the local news across the country, we don't think we need to get even close to that big of an industry. And the reason is because while technology has completely disrupted this industry, upended this industry, and where we are where we are right now, it also has made it much, much, much less expensive to deliver quality to, to, to build these organizations, which means that, you know, there for, first of all, a lot of the role that local newspapers played is not necessary anymore. So, you know, when, at the height of local journalism, when they were covering restaurant reviews and movie reviews. Frankly, that's covered. We're, we got that. Technology did a fabulous job of reimagining that business model. But the civic reporting, the original reporting on our civic institutions, technology has not disrupted that. So we, we have made it much less expensive to build back these, this industry, which I think is really heartening. We think that this is, we need to build back a $2 billion annual industry across the country. Um, $2 billion is not that much. We spend $1.5 billion a year on performing arts philanthropy. So we can do this. Like we, we can build this back across the country. Um, 
The other thing is that to get these websites up and running, it's a lot cheaper than getting a printing press, the, the trucks, of course. I mean, so there's a lot of aspects that technology has made this really, really promising to imagine being able to very, very quickly build back a industry of nonprofit newsrooms across the country. Um, but of course, it also was is has disrupted the industry so dramatically that we are currently in this space where where we are really struggling to keep our communities. Sarah, place. you know, something you touch upon in terms of you know technology, you know, sort of had, like we don't need restaurant review, but we still need sort of coverage of um, civic institution. You know, that that comes. To, you know, when we think about media, we think about sort of its scale and its enormity, right? Like a newspaper, you know, like both local and national. Do you think the future of media, you know, are, are we sort of, are we trying to replicate the same kind of size? Or are we thinking about, or do you see the future of a healthy local journalism ecosystem equate to sort of your local coffee shop and your local restaurants? Like, do you ever see them being run like a small business versus sort of like, you know, again, like people's perception of like the news, right? Like the news is like, we think about like, when we turn on the TV or radio, like what is the news of the future? Is it more mop and pop or is it sort of like back, back in the days where you have these major regional players? I think the answer is probably somewhere in between. I mean, we need to start building up much more highly professional organizations um, that are scalable. We have to start seeing some economies of scale. I don't believe that we are going to build back a $2 billion industry across this country with tiny, tiny organizations recreating, you know, finance operations, HR operations, fundraising operations over and over and over and over again. I just, I, I don't think it's a, a uh, it, it is a efficient way to build back the news gathering infrastructure that we need. So uh, I think we are going to start seeing nonprofit organizations that are strong, that are scalable, that are sharing resources, that are expanding. Um, and those won't be tiny, quote, mom and pop organizations. We'll be looking to other industries like education, like public service industries that have created really highly professional multi-million dollar nonprofits. That, that I think is the direction that we need to start seeing. And I think there's there are, is a lot of talent out there that is starting to build those. Marcus, do you agree? Mostly, I, I agree entirely that media is not gonna look as big, it's not gonna be as big as it used to be. I mean, part of the reason media, the, the dollar size of media was so large is because media companies were monopolies and they charged large amounts of money to their advertisers and they and subscribers had nowhere else to go for information. and. You know, and they had, and they also had huge, big, heavy industry kind of, you know, back ends. They, if you're a newspaper and you were publishing, when I was running the Wall Street Journal, you will remember, Paul, because you were there, we had 17 <laughs> printing plants across the country printing the Wall Street Journal every day so we could deliver it to every doorstep that wanted it in America every morning by 7 a.m. Huge costs. And, you know, the advertising support of that, and they, because they were, the only game in town for big business information, very profitable for many, many years. I think you know, technology does actually, you know, the, the positive side of technology, I'm, I'm quick sometimes to be, to be negative on it, but the positive side, as you've said, is it makes it easier to do, to do high quality journalism, distribute that journalism quickly to lots of people. Um, and it makes it much lower cost to operate a, a media company. And so I don't think that we're gonna see, you know, the rebuilding of this giant enterprise. I think actually, media companies of the future will tend to be a collection of smaller brands that aggregate into something that generates a meaningful amount of revenue and profit rather than individual brands. I think it's, in fact, I think it's a strategic mistake for a lot of, that a lot of media companies continue to make to think that their one brand, they have to hang everything off their one brand because the reality is in the digital world, which is very, you know, the, the, econo the, the logic of the digital universe is to deliver content in vertical ways to specific audiences. And so you build up different verticals and they add up to something that's larger rather than trying to make one brand fit all these different verticals because it becomes sort of incomprehensible at some point for consumers. 
And if new, I mean, I know we spent a lot of conversation around newspaper because I think newspaper traditionally serve as sort of like the anchor mall of your local information ecosystem. You know, do you see, do we need an anchoring institution right now? And if we don't, you know, do we see public media and your local television taking place of that anchoring? So I would argue that the reason why we're talking about newspapers so much is that even in their very meager state right now, they still provide the vast majority of original reporting. So while public radio and broadcast TV is doing good and important vital work, it's really minutes on the hour of the kind of shoe leather reporting, call, making phone calls, showing up, asking questions. And that has been the service that newspapers have provided. So. It is not so much that we need to be building back newspapers online. In fact, I don't think that is what we need to be doing. We need to be delivering content in a way that communities receive content, whether by text or by WhatsApp or in visual form or videos. And we're seeing a lot of innovation around that. What we need to be doing is funding organizations that are prioritizing ori original report. Yeah, and, and that's right. I, I don't think there has to be newspapers in every community and we should there is, a, there is a very big nostalgia factor in a lot of the commentary around the decline of, of journalism and media. I mean, I recognize the loss of journalists in the country. I see large numbers of people who once were covering their communities, but there was a huge amount of redundancy. In a lot of people who are covering the same things and you don't need, you know, if you, back when they had White House press conferences because of COVID or because of the current president, you know, you would see 50 people all crowded uh, into, a, into the room and the thing would be live streamed and everybody would be in there and half of them never ask a question and it raised you know, kind of the obvious question, do you really need everybody there? But that sort, of, that sort of redundancy existed in media across the country in various forms in various markets. So the shrinking of, of, the, newspaper, of the newspaper industry in terms of the number of people is not totally unexpected. That's what digital technologies do to every industry. They basically, they rationalize and it's it's painful for any industry. But I think what about now is rebuilding that industry doesn't necessarily mean rebuilding people in the same kinds of jobs, doing the same kinds of things. I think it should look different. You don't necessarily have to have reporters covering the same things they covered before. The reason they were structured the way they were structured is because they were monopoly businesses. They made a lot of money and they could afford to have one person doing everything they wanted to do. Many of those jobs, as Sarah Best said before, are not necessary. The civic responsibility side is critical. One other point on this, you asked about, you know, we keep mentioning public radio, public television. Public radio in many markets has built up very strong newsrooms. In Chicago, when Goli Sheikh Lassani was running um, WBEZ, built up a very significant newsroom. At the same time, the big papers there were struggling with, with their economic troubles. I think there should be changes, I think, that the Congress and the FCC should make sure it's possible for radio stations, television stations, and newspapers locally to operate combined newsrooms because it's not that every community needs five different newsrooms. They actually need one strong newsroom covering the community. And I'm not thinking of it from an economic point of view. This is a monopoly. Again, we've recreated the monopoly. I'm thinking of it from the point of view of really serving the community from, from an information point of view. Yeah, that, that resonates. I mean, one of the things that the paper of record did have going for it, one of the many things it had going for it, was the sense of responsibility. Just saying, look, I know that it's not the sexiest thing in the world to show up to that school board meeting, but we're going to do it because we're the paper of record and we've got to do it. And we do need these institutions to have that sense of responsibility for just covering the, the community. And so... We, we need to start seeing, this can't be so diffuse that we don't have that sense of response. And Sarah, you know, um, Todd from the audience had raised a question that, you know, you know, his main concern is whether nonprofit model is sustainable given the serious recession, right? Because you saw talk about nonprofit, um, you know, philanthropy having a role in it. What happened if philanthropy basically say, you know what, this is, you know, markets for you in, in, in terms of for-profit is, what is, like, why should anyone whether it's philanthropy or for invest in journalism right now? Yeah. Well, so first I'll say 
COVID-19 has, has rapidly accelerated the decline of commercial news for the exact same dynamic that this question asker is asking about, which is that advertising dollars have dried up. So it is not that the commercial, the commercial model is not more secure. What we've seen actually is that nonprofits have been able to weather this, this recession so far quite well. Why? Because they have diversified revenue. You don't just have, sure, one donor may have to pull out. A few donors may pull out, but then others will lean in. And we saw this. I mean, the Texas Tribune, for instance, which I mentioned earlier, they have weathered this incredibly well because of that revenue pie that is really diverse, meaning, you know, they're, their event went online, but philanthropists leaned in, recognizing that, okay, we know this is really important. We're going we're gonna to give more this year. You need to create a resilient and diversified set of, you know, set of revenue, which means many, many donors, not just one. Many, um, you know, expand your memberships and have many members, some of which will pull out right now and some of which will not. Um, so I think what we're finding is that as these organizations are really thinking thoughtfully about how to bring in as many lines of revenue as possible, they're actually finding themselves much more resilient during this time than we saw from a model that relied on 80% you know, ad revenue. And you know, again, we sort of go back and forth like the, the business model, the business model, uh, and I just wanna make it very clear, and I want you guys to make it very clear is, is there one model? Are you no. seeing that there could be 50 different models? Like how many sort of like, mo like how do you, because I think we just love, you know, especially for tech, like we know what that successful exit is, right? You get an IPO, you, you get bought out, right? Like, is it fair to compare sort of, um, you know, the journalism exit to the tech exit or to traditional business exit? Look, I, I think the businesses, the local journalism businesses in this country are going to take many different approaches. Some will be supported through nonprofit models. Some will figure out a subscription model that works for their community and, and maybe be newsletter driven. I, you may have seen recently um, Axios announced they're going to start doing local newsletters. Um, David Plotz, the brilliant former editor of Slate, has recently announced that he's starting something called CityCast, which is going to be doing podcasts and newsletters in communities. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for innovation in these communities. I don't think everything has to go to an IPO. I don't think, you know, just a bit of interesting history, you know, newspaper companies were the tech companies of their time. When they went public in the 1960s and 1970s, they were these megaliths. They made the Washington, the city of Washington has still got people wandering around on their walkers who were Washington Post because they worked for the Grant family with the company in public. And this new, you know, when I started working for the New York Times as a copy boy in 1982, a while ago, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post Company, Times Mirror, Chicago Tribune Company, they were all in the Fortune 500. They were all probably in the Fortune 200. They were big companies, big and successful. I don't think that that's necessarily the path anymore. The path is a path towards viability. So should people be investing in local media companies? It depends. Maybe if you're in the right size community, it might be a profitable, might be a path to being significantly profitable. I'm not sure that they all lead to, you know, to lead to IPOs. I don't think that the newspaper chains in the last 10 years, I think they all kind of wish they hadn't had such big appetites and acquired so many newspapers and acquired so much debt to acquire those newspapers. It was a bad experience for them. But is there a possibility that you could, you could have profitable local media companies around the country? Sure, absolutely, especially in some of the bigger cities. Or maybe you can you know, pull together a string of small newspapers or magazines in different communities. But I don't think that, I don't think it would be smart to think about local media as, anything like sort of technology companies in terms of how they generate revenue. They're not businesses that scale in the same way. You know, they add revenue when they add customers and it's, it's a lot more like operating Walmart at small scale than it is like operating Google. And Sarah Beth? Yeah. I would, as we come out of this election where our country spent twice what we've ever played, spent on a presidential election, $14 billion on the election, 
we are that th that is dollars that we're trying to invest in the future of our country. We now that election is over and we need to be investing in just the fundamental civic institutions and play the long game on this. And so I, I think the investment here is really an investment in the strength of our political culture and our communities. And I think that's really a extraordinarily important investment and one people can be making at a really large scale if they have capacity to do that or at a small scale to become members of their public radio and local nonprofit newsroom. So there you have it. We are time. Um, thank you, Marcus and Sarah Beth, for your insight. Um, for anyone who want to reach out to them, they are very easily, you could find them on Twitter and um, and also on um, some of these social platforms. And with that, um, stay tuned for the next panel. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Sarah Beth.